to everyone. Uh, my name is Yasser Baghdadi. I'm a professor of cardiology in Cairo University. My talk today will be about the pharmacological treatment of heart failure, evidence from recent clinical trials. I'll be going through most of the clinical trials of the, uh, the, of the drugs that have been documented to improve the morbidity and mortality in patients with heart failure starting with the old drugs and going into the newer drugs that have been tried out recently. So if we go and look at the guidelines themselves, we can see that the class 1A uh, drugs include an ACE inhibitor with the addition of a beta blocker for symptomatic patients with HEFREF. Uh, you can either start with an ACE inhibitor or you can start with a beta blocker. Both are acceptable in the guidelines and an MRA antagonist, mineralocorticoid antagonist, is recommended in patients with uh, HEFREF, also as a class 1A, uh, in addition to ACE inhibitors and beta blockers in patients with symptomatic uh, heart failure, despite taking ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. So these are the three main drugs, uh, the cornerstone of the management of patients with HEFREF, and these have been proved to improve both the morbidity and the mortality of patients with HEFREF. Now, if we come to updates uh, in the guidelines, we see that uh, uh, the ARNIs have been added. Uh, the so-called Entresto has been given a class 1B indication either to replace the ACE inhibitor uh, or the ARB or to be given as a standalone therapy at the beginning in patients with HEFREF. Of course, you can't combine an ARNI with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. You have to stop ACE inhibitors at least 36 hours before starting the ARNI. And uh, you shouldn't give an ARNI, of course, if the patient has angioedema. Now, this is the heart failure classification. Heart failure classifications, we have two classifications. The New York Heart Association classification, classes 1 to 4, according to the symptomatology on exertion. So a class 1 is a limitation to normal, no limitation to physical activity, normal physical activity. A class 2, there's slight limitation. A class 3, there's marked limitation uh, of activity. And a class 4 is a patient unable to carry out any physical activity without developing symptoms or symptoms of heart failure at rest. The ACC, or the American Heart Association, staging of heart failure include a stage A, stage B, C, and D. A are patients who have risk factors for developing heart failure, but they don't have structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure. A class B is a patient who has structural heart disease, but without signs and symptoms of heart failure. A stage C are structural heart disease with symptoms, either current or previous. And a stage D are patients with refractory heart failure. So this is the heart failure classification that we all use to classify our patients. And this is uh, uh, the flow chart of how to treat a patient with HEFREF. First of all, you start therapy with either an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker, whichever one you choose according to the patient, or you can combine them both together. Uh, if the patient is still symptomatic and the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 35, then you can add a mineralocorticoid antagonist, aldosterone antagonist. If the patient is still symptomatic and the left ventricular ejection fraction is still less than 35%, then you can give uh, either replace uh, the ACE inhibitor uh, or the ARB with an ARNI, or if the patient is in sinus rhythm and has a QRS duration of more than 130 millisecond, then he can be indicated to insert uh, CRT. If the patient has sinus rhythm with uh, a heart rate of more than 70, then you can give evabridine for this patient to decrease the heart rate and thus decrease the symptoms of heart failure. If all the uh, above medications are given uh, and the patient uh, still has resistant symptoms, then he, sh he can add other drugs like digoxin or hydralazine isozorbide dinitrate, or he can have a left ventricular assisted device or heart failure transplantation. Any stage in which the patient becomes asymptomatic, you continue on the current medications. And again, I tell you these are the drugs that have been proven to decrease the mortality. As you can see, the largest mortality reduction was seen with beta blockers, 
That's why all patients have to be placed on beta blockers with around 35% reduction in mortality. Mineralocorticoid antagonists also have a large reduction in mortality of around 27 or 28%. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers have less uh, or a more modest effect on survival, but they still decrease the survival and they markedly improve the symptomatology of the patient. And in this uh, table, you can see how we grade our medications according either to the uh, New York Heart Association classification of symptoms or due to the staging according to the ACC or AHA classification. It's starting with, uh, with an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker, then combining them both together, then adding an aldosterone antagonist, and then adding other medications like isorbide, dinitrate, hydralazine combination, diuretics, uh, digoxin and so forth. Now here are some important clinical points that you have to take uh, care of. First of all, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers and spironolactone should not be removed if the symptoms improve because these medications slow the disease progression and decrease mortality. So you have to continue on the medications whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. You don't stop the medications for life. And although ACE inhibitors are listed first, evidence shows that an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker may be started first, and then the other added to the first drug given. It's reasonable to titrate the dosage of each agent in an alternating stepwise fashion to reach the target dose. So you can increase the dose of each one, alternating between an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker every time the patient comes to, you, to visit you. For patients who are intolerant to ACE inhibitors, you can give an angiotensin receptor blocker, which can be substituted for these patients. Now, uh, there's no explicit evidence for the benefit of beta blockers in asymptomatic patients. However, many of the patients will have other indications for beta blocker, like coronary artery disease. And beta blockers may be safely added or continued in patients with rest dyspnea, except in those who have signs of congestion or hemodynamic instability. So it's these two conditions where there's congestion like pulmonary edema or subacute pulmonary edema, or the patient is hypotensive and needs inotropic uh, support. In these patients, you shouldn't give beta blockers. An aldosterone antagonist may be appropriately in initiated for symptomatic patients within 14 days of a myocardial infarction. The benefit of combining isozorbide dinitrate and hydralazine occurred mostly in patients who were African-American, the dark-skinned uh, patients. The combination may be added if tolerated by the patient's blood pressure without, without, and that's important, without reducing the ACE inhibitor or beta blocker dosage to sub-target dosages. Other important clinical points include uh, that drugs used for symptomatic relief may be withdrawn if no improvement is perceived, like, say, diuretics or nitrates by themselves. However, you should take care because digoxin withdrawal may result in clinical deterioration and should be done with caution. Adding an ARB to ACE does improve symptoms in some patients, but you have to take care, take care in these patients is that if you combine these two drugs together, say in patients with renal failure, you won't be able to give patients an aldosterone antagonist. So uh, you shouldn't combine them together and there's little evidence of the safety of combining them both together. And definitely you shouldn't combine an ACE, ARB, and an, and an, and, uh, an uh, aldosterone antagonist together because all three can result in marked increase in the potassium level, which can be life-threatening for the patients. Now we come to beta blockers. Now, as you can see, there were a large number of trials done on beta blockers, starting with the CIBIS trial, which wasn't very effective uh, in 1994, but the CIBIS-2 trial using bezoprolol uh, showed a 34% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, other drugs that have been found to be uh, markedly uh, beneficial for the patients include carvidolol, which has the Capricorn, and the Copernicus trials, which also showed uh, a marked relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, the merit heart failure using the long-acting metoprolol also showed around a 34% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality. The seniors trial using nebivirol didn't show uh, a significant difference in mortality, although there was a marked reduction 
in heart failure hospitalization. And the primary endpoint of combining mortality and the heart failure, heart failure hospitalization was significant in this trial. So beta blockers in patients with sinus rhythm, they decrease the all-cause mortality, they decrease cardiovascular death, and they decrease cardiovascular hospitalization and the combination of death and hospitalization. But as you can see, the improvement uh, in the use of beta blockers only occurs when the uh, ejection fraction is reduced. So when we come to the most right-hand sided uh, bar, as you can see in patients with preserved ejection fraction of more than 50%, there was no mortality or uh, benefit while either all cause or cardiovascular in giving beta blockers in those patients. So beta blockers are mainly used for HEF-REF patients and the lower the, the ejection fraction, the better the reduction in mortality and morbidity. As you can see in this trial, the all-cause mortality, left, eject, left ventricular ejection fraction, marks reduction in, uh, in mortality if the ejection fraction is less than 40, becomes more modest when the ejection fraction is between 40 and 49, and then you lose the mortality benefit when you have an ejection fraction of more than 50. The same occurs also with uh, patient, the cardiovascular mortality, again, less than 40%. There's marked improvement in the mortality, more modest in the uh, uh, range of 40 to 49, and then you lose the mortality benefit when the ejection fraction is over 50%. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the change in the left ventricular ejection fraction from baseline was more marked the lower the ejection fraction. So at, a low, at an ejection fraction of less than 20%, you have around a 5% increase in the ejection fraction by giving beta blockers. This is reduced to around 1.9% in patients with uh, an ejection fraction between 40 and 49. Now, is there uh, a benefit between one beta blocker and the other? Like, should we give carvidolol more uh, better than metoprolol? This was studied in the COMET trial and it was found that carvidolol was more effective than metoprolol. But the metoprolol used here was the metoprolol tartrate, which is not the long-acting metoprolol. After the merit heart failure, which used metoprolol succinate, the 200 milligram dose, the mortality uh, between the two drugs was almost exactly the same. So there's no real benefit of one beta blocker as opposed to the other and those that were used to actually study patients with HEF-REF, uh, but you have to use the maximum targeted heart doses in, uh, uh, in these trials. So is there an advantage, another advantage between beta blockers? You can do that according to the symptoms of the patients and the underlying disease. Both metoprolol and carvidolol, as you can see, have been tried out in clinical trials. Uh, metoprolol, because it's more selective, has less fatigue, Carvidolol is cheaper and can be used better for hypertensive patients or diabetic patients. Metoprolol causes less dizziness and less bronchial asthma. Uh, an important thing to note is that you have to have a target beta blocker dose. You have to reach the target of the beta blocker dose. So in carvidolol, it should be 25 milligrams twice daily, although some trials have even tried 50 milligrams twice daily. Metoprolol succinate, long-acting metoprolol, you give it at, at a dose of 200 milligrams daily. Bezoprolol should be given at 10 milligrams daily, as in the Cibis-1 and the Cibis-2 trials. Now we come to the other uh, group of drugs, which are the ACE inhibitors. Now the benefits of ACE inhibitors is that they improve the symptoms. They improve the exercise capacity and the clinical status of the patients. They improve the cardiac fun functions, they reduce hospitalization, attenuate remodeling, and prolong survival for the patients. They also reduce the vascular risk, as was found in the HOPE trial. The different trials uh, of ACE inhibitors have now become old, they're traditional, they're all of us know them. The SAFE trial, the SOLVED, the AIR, the TRACE, the ATLAS, and the GC3, using most of the ACE inhibitors like Captopril and Inelopril or Ramapril, and they all showed improvement in symptomatology of the patient and improvement in the mortality of these patients. Now, is giving a lower dose the same as giving a higher dose? This is an important trial. In the ATLAS trial, patients who were given suboptimal doses of the ACE inhibitors, uh, 
compared to those who were given the optimal doses, as you can see, there was loss of the mortality. There was no change in the mortality. It didn't make a difference whether you give a smaller dose or a larger dose in terms of mortality by itself. But if you combine mortality with hospitalization, then you get a difference. Those with a high dose, they have less hospitalization and mortality compared to those on the lower dose. Uh, again, patients with congestive heart failure hospitalization compared to all-cause hospitalization was markedly improved if you give the target dose, the high dose of the ACE inhibitor compared to the lower dose of ACE inhibitors. Now, um, as you can see, a lot of us uh, sometimes are scared to give ACE inhibitors in patients who are, may, uh, who are likely to be a bit hypertensive, especially when the mean systolic blood pressure is around the 90. They're scared that the drop in blood pressure will affect the patients. But what was found is that giving, uh, giving ACE inhibitors or RAS antagonists in those in the lower quantile of, hyper, of uh, blood pressure they had the biggest improvement in the, uh, in the mortality. As can be seen, uh, the mortality effect was higher in the Volzartan group. If the blood pressure was on the low side, in systolic 90 to 110, compared to when the blood pressure was more than 110. So giving ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients with a low blood pressure is beneficial, and it does result in increase in the blood pressure for these patients. And, if, of course, it improves both the mortality and the heart failure hospitalization. So the take-home points of ACE inhibitors, they're indicated for patients with an ejection fraction of less than 40 and all New York Heart Association classes. Use the target doses using clinical trials. Intolerance due to cardiorenal limitations associated with poor prognosis. So if the patient has a cardiorenal limitation of giving ACE inhibitor, then he will have a poor prognosis. Ad adverse effects do occur, like cough and angioedema uh, and anemia. Increasing the creatinine by 0.5 milligrams uh, every deciliter is expected. Uh, most trials have uh, uh, excluded patients when their creatinine is more than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. Now, uh, ARBs, uh, as compared to ACE inhibitors, are excellent and proven alternatives to ACE inhibitors. And there are a number of trials, the ELITE, the Valhef, the CHARM, the Optimal, and the Valiant trials, all have compared uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and all have been found to be non-inferior. So when do we use ARBs in heart failure? According to the ACC and AHA recommendations, you can use them as an alternative to ACE when the ACE inhibitors are not tolerated, and that's a class one. They can be added to ACE inhibitors, as I mentioned before, but that's a class 2b and not recommended for most patients because most of our heart failure patients or HFREF patients, we like to add uh, an, uh, an aldosterone antagonist, so you can't combine an ACE and a half in these, uh, ACE and ARBs in these patients. Uh, you can use uh, an ARB after beta blocker titration, uh, and as I just said, don't combine aldosterone antagonists, ACE and ARBs together, and that's a class 3 recommendation contraindication. Also, as an alternative to ACE inhibitors, after you try, try uh, uh, an ACE inhibitor, you can change uh, to an ARB, but you have to have uh, special precautions and take care that you don't develop angioedema. If you have persistent hypertension or symptoms, uh, after using optimal doses of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, you can change the ACE inhibitor to an ARB in these patients. Now, more recently, in uh, 2014, um, a new drug was given, and that's the angiotensin neprilysin inhibitor. Uh, and this was compared, which is we call it now Entresto, compared to enalapril in patients with heart failure. And this was the first drug after a long period of time, which again showed improvement in mortality in patients with HFREF. The trial included patients with New York Heart Association class 2 to 4. This is the paradigm trial. Uh, the BMP was elevated, and the NC-PRO BMP was also elevated. Left ejection fraction, of course, was reduced. Patients were on ACE or ARBs. The blood pressure was more than 100, and the estimated glomerular filtration rate was more than 30. Now, uh, as you can see in the paradigm heart failure trial, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations 
was significantly reduced when Entresto was compared to Enalapril with a highly significant uh, p-value and uh, a hazard risk of 0.8, that's a 20% reduction. The numbers needed to treat were 21 patients to get one benefit of either death or hospitalization. Now in the par Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, the other endpoints, including the cardiovascular death, was reduced by 20%, heart failure hospitalization was reduced by 20%, the overall mortality was reduced by 16%, heart failure deaths was removed by was reduced by 21%, and sudden death was reduced by 20%. Other ANI benefits include reduced risk of hyperkalemia with when combined with MRAs. They reduce heart failure hospitalization, and that is apparent in the first 30 days. You can also give them now during hospitalization of the patient after they recover from acute heart failure. Uh, after they recover from acute heart failure. There's an absolute benefit across a spectrum of patient risks, and the benefit is consistent regardless of the background treatment. There's res less renal insufficiency, but there's more hypertension with the use of the ARNI. That's why in the 2017 ACC AHA heart failure guidelines, ARNIs were given a class uh, one level of evidence B, either to replace uh, ACEs or ARBs, uh, or to give them uh, in naive patients who haven't received ACE and ARBs. Of course, they shouldn't be combined with either an ACE. The last ACE or ARB dose should be 36 hours uh, before starting ARNI. Also, ARNI should not uh, be given to patients with history of angioedema. Okay, next we come to mineralocorticoid antagonists, the MRAs. Now, aldosterone in heart failure is released from the adrenal cortex and other tissues in response to angiotensin II, ACTH, and potassium. It promotes sodium retention, potassium, and magnesium wasting. It induces myocardial and vascular fibrosis. It activates the sympathetic nervous system and inhibits the parasympathetic nervous system. The extra adrenal uh, aldosterone production was also increased in patients, uh, uh, is also increased in the heart. There's an increase of more than 20 times in the aldosterone level in patients with heart failure, and aldosterone escape from ACE inhibitors has been uh, shown. Now, the benefit of aldosterone antagonists was, uh, was shown in the RAILS trial. The RAILS trial was a multicenter randomized trial of, of spironolactone and aldosterone antagonist versus placebo in patients with a New York Heart uh, Association class 3 or 4. Uh, it was uh, done on around 1,600 patients with a mean follow-up of two years. The, uh, the primary endpoint was all-cause death. And as you can see, the all-cause death was significantly reduced in the spironolactone group. And the New York Heart Association class was significantly improved, in, again, in the spironolactone group. Because of these dramatic results, the safety monitoring board stopped the trial early. Mortality uh, uh, was markedly reduced in these patients, and uh, thus the conclusion of the trial was among patients with New York Heart Association class 3 or 4 heart failure, treatment was with spironolactone was associated with reduced mortality, improved symptoms, and decreased hospitalizations. Now, uh, as you can see here, the RAILS trial, 70% uh, of the patients were in class 3, 30% were in class 4, 10% of the patients were on beta blockers, potassium chloride was discouraged. Exclusion criteria included patients who had a creatinine of more than 2.5 or a potassium of more than 5. The dose was 25 milligrams a day, and lab measurements were done at one week and at four weeks. The drug was withheld, withheld if the potassium level was more than 6 or the creatinine jumped to more than 4. So, aldosterone antagonists should be considered in most patients with heart failure who have an ejection fraction of less than 40. Potassium and renal functions should be assessed regularly. Contraindication uh, uh, is hyperkalemia, when the potassium is more than 5, or advanced renal insufficiency with a creatinine clearance of less than 30, or a creatinine of more than 2.5. Be cautious in the elderly, and in those with diabetes, and those uh, who use concomitant drugs that uh, inhibit the CYP3A4 
uh, inhibitors, especially with epilonone. You can consider epilonone as in the euphesis trial post-MI and in those with side effects uh, to spironolactone, and it is preferable to a potassium supplementation if the patient has hypokalemia. Again, the monorhinocorticoid uh, receptor antagonist resulted in a mortality reduction of somewhere around the 27 to 28%. Uh, as we saw from these uh, previous trials, the guideline medical therapy in patients with HFREF should include either an ACE or an ARB, an ARBNI in replacement of an ACE or an ARB, a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, hydralazine nitrates in uh, the African Americans or the dark skinned people, CRT and ICD. And as you can see, the numbers needed to treat for all these drugs are less than 100. So all these drugs result in marked improvement in the mortality. Now we come to the newer drugs, specifically the anti-diabetic drugs and the group, the SGL2 inhibitors. Now, SGL2 inhibitors and patients with heart failure, uh, with or without diabetes, have uh, common backgrounds. Patients with diabetes and heart failure have similar pathophysiological features. Both have endothelial function and both have insulin resistance. Now, the mechanistic effect of SGL2 inhibitors are seen in patients with and without diabetes. They have diuretic effects, so they cause natriuresis, and they cause glucosuria. They also have metabolic effects, increasing glucagon and increasing ketone bodies, and all these have been put forward as theories of why this group of drugs improves the mortality in patients with diabetes and now in patients with heart failure. The cardiovascular benefits of SGL2 inhibitors are largely independent of the glucose levels. Here we see two large trials performed on SGL2 inhibitors. The CANVAS trial uh, uh, performed on uh, canagliflozin uh, compared to placebo again showed uh, a reduction in uh, the primary uh, endpoint of both uh, hospitalization, mortality, and uh, reduction of stroke and, uh, and myocardial infarction. Empereg also uh, resulted in marked reduction of hospitalization and was the first and the largest trial uh, that showed that empagliflozin improved the mortality in diabetic patients uh, with and without heart failure. Um, specifically, dapagliflozin uh, was chosen to, uh, to undergo a trial in patients with heart failure. In around 4,700 patients, uh, more than 18 years of age, either they were given dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams, with the standard care medications, uh, and this was compared to a placebo with the standard care medications. It didn't matter whether the patient had diabetes or didn't have diabetes. The primary endpoint was the time to first occurrence of either uh, a composite cardiovascular death or hospitalization uh, for heart failure or an urgent heart failure visit. The secondary endpoints were the individual endpoints and the primary mainly uh, for the patients. And as you can see, uh, the SGL2 inhibitor reduced the cardiovascular death and reduced worsening of heart failure events in patients with HFREF. Dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams once daily on standard care therapy reduced the all-cause endpoint, primary endpoint of mortality and hospitalization, and also reduced the death by itself. In the Kansas City cardiomyopathy uh, questionnaire, you can also see that the improvement in the symptoms uh, was more pronounced in those in the dapagliflozin group compared to the placebo group. Now, the question was, did it matter whether the patient was diabetic or non-diabetic? Uh, in the non-diabetic subgroup, uh, as you can see, there was also marked improvement in both the mortality and the hospitalization, almost equivalent, if not a little bit better, than patients who were diabetic. So dapagliflozin worked on heart failure patients even if they didn't have diabetes. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, compared to the individual uh, endpoints, the primary end, uh, outcome endpoints, Worsening heart failure was far more significantly improved by the dapagliflozin, but there was also improvement in the cardiovascular death. Uh, 
The second group of drugs are the GLP-1 agonists. Now, uh, SGL2 inhibitors, uh, like the GLP-1 agonists, both have arterial protection, and both lower the glucose, and both have cardiac protection. Uh, the difference between them is that although both of them reduce the three-point mace in patients with diabetes, they re reduce the cardiovascular death, and they reduce the, M uh, the MIs, and they reduce stroke, when compared to hos hospitalization for heart failure, as can be shown on the right-hand panel, that uh, GLP-1s did not reduce uh, uh, hospitalization for heart failure compared, that was found in the leader's trial using the liraglutide, compared to the empagliflozin in the Empereg outcome trial. So GLP-1s did not improve ho heart failure hospitalization, although they did improve the cardiovascular death uh, in diabetic patients. So if we look at the new diabetic uh, medications, we can see DPP-4s are mainly neutral, GLP-1 agonists are neutral in patients with heart failure. SGL2 inhibitors are the only group that are beneficial in patients with uh, heart failure, as was seen in the Impreg, Canvas, and the DAPA heart failure trial. Now, another group of drugs, we move on, the Evabridine. Uh, the Evabridine uh, was tried out, and this is uh, the funny channel uh, inhibitor, uh, and this was the SHIFT trial. And uh, evabridine was given to patients as a selective inhibitor of the sodium-potassium channel, uh, which is highly expressed in the sinoatrial node. So they decreased the heart rate in sinus with patients. And this was performed on 6,500 patients, class New York Heart Association class 2 to 4, with a left ventricular rejection fraction of less than 35, when their heart rate was more than 70. So they had to have a heart rate of more than 70 to enter the trial. The primary composite endpoint uh, of the trial was cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And as you can see, there was an 18% reduction in the composite endpoint of death and hospitalization in the evabridine group. Uh, uh, this was mainly powered by the reduction in the hospitalization for worsening heart failure. This was highly significant. That is why evabridine was given a 2A classification to be given to patients with heart failure if their symptoms didn't improve after giving them ACE inhibitor or NARB, uh, a beta blocker, and uh, uh, an aldosterone antagonist. You can give uh, evabridine to do, reduce the heart rate and further reduce the symptomatology of the patient and to reduce hospitalization from heart failure. Uh, another new drug that was tried is the ver uh, Versiguat, which is a soluble, soluble granulate cyclase stimulator. Now, uh, in patients with heart failure, you have endothelial dysfunction, and this re results in decrease in the cyclic GMP. This deficiency in the cyclic GMP results in further myocardial dysfunction and vascular dys dysfunction. Versiguat increases the cyclic GMP levels and stimulates the production of cyclic GMP, and thus, theoretically, should improve the myocardial dysfunction and the vascular dysfunction. The first trial performed on Varisiguat was the Socrates trial, and this was mainly a dose-finding dose trial, and it was tried in patients with both HEFREF and HEFPEF. So it had two arms, HEFREF and HEFPEF, uh, with, uh, uh, with the, uh, an injection fraction of less than 45 to decrease, to see both, both arms of the trial. Uh, NT-Pro BMP was used to see if there was improvement in the heart uh, in, the, in giving the drug for these patients. Now, the, the optimal dose of uh, Versiguat was found to be 2.5 to 10 milligrams. And although there was no marked decrease in NT-Pro NT BMP, except in this small subgroup, there was marked improvement in the symptomatology of the patients. Uh, and this resulted in another larger trial, the Victoria trial, was, which was done on this drug. And as you, uh, just to mention, the Versiquat again failed to show any improvement in patients with preserved ejection fraction. So the, the, the Victoria trial 
was done uh, using Versiguat in patients with HEF-REF uh, in a dose of 2.5 uh, increased and titrated up to 10 milligrams compared to a placebo with the primary endpoint to, uh, which was for, uh, first occurrence of composite uh, cardiovascular death or again heart failure hospitalization. And as you can see, there was a significant to the p-value of 0.02 when Versiguat was given to standard care therapy in patients with HEFREF. Uh, the primary endpoint again was driven mainly by reduction in the hospitalization, not related to uh, increase in the cardiovascular death. So the drug resulted in marked improvement uh, in the, or marked reduction in the hospitalization uh, with the composite endpoint again becoming significant when hospitalization was combined to mortality. Now there are other drugs that are being tried out. Uh, Omicamtiv, uh, which is a cardiac myocyte, uh, myosine activator, uh, which is in a phase three trial, which should be completed in 2021. Serilaxin, uh, Tolvaptan, a number of drugs are being tried out. Some have already failed and haven't shown improvement in the morbidity or mortality or hospitalization, uh, well, but we're waiting for the results of the Omicamptiv to see whether there will be improvement in mortality and heart failure hospitalization. So finally, to summarize everything, uh, principles of uh, HEF-REF medication dose titration, you should know the target dose of HEF-REF medication used in clinical trials. Relatively low blood pressure alone is not a contraindication to use HEF-REF medications follow symptoms and end organ dysfunction. Beta blockers should be titrated to the target doses. ACEs, ARBs, and RNA dosing should be adjusted to facilitate beta blocker titration. So titrate beta blockers to the optimum dose, very important. Titrate all medication targeting doses uh, every two to four weeks, increasing those every two to four weeks and following the blood pressure to titrate your dose. Regular monitoring of symptoms, Blood pressure, heart rate, and lab testings for electrolytes and renal functions should, be, should guide uh, dose titration. Tolerating only low-dose HEFREF medication or, wor or worsening intolerance of such medication should prompt consideration of referral to a heart failure center capable of advanced therapies like transplantation or a left ventricular assisted device. To summarize, RAS antagonism remains the cornerstone of therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, beta blockers should be carefully titrated to gold doses in stable patients. Aldosterone antagonists are indicated in symptoms in symptomatic systolic heart failure. ACE and ARBs should, re should be replaced by an ARNI as appropriate according to the guidelines. Uh, natriuretic peptides are useful when there's diagnostic uncertainty and for pro prognostic purposes. Heart failure hospitalizations are ominous and best prevented by guideline medications, disease management programs, and close follow-up of patients. And thank you very much.